Hi, I'm Arvad Barney, a trainer for Academy of Experience. This is a podcast of Academy of Experience, an NGO active in the field of youth work, training youth workers and actively using outdoor education. The podcast is called Forash, Source in Hungarian. We invite youth workers, trainers, coaches, facilitators and outdoor professionals. The first episode was the first part of the conversation with Lena Conlan from Sweden and US who is active uh, as an outdoor educator and trainer in wilderness first aid. She works for NOS and Crossing Latitudes. I think it's really a unique opportunity that uh, you can listen to someone with so much experience. Before we start, I just would like to say that if you haven't listened to the first episode, uh, I really recommend uh, to listen to it because we cover a lot of topics there and this is the continuation of that. Enjoy. You've seen beautiful nature all around the world and you've seen maybe changes in this, so is there a change in how we treat nature? Yeah. Now, the first story that comes to mind is that I'm one of the lucky who sea kayaked on Prince William Sound in Alaska before the tremendous oil spill that we had 1989. So uh, uh, Exxon Valdez, a big oil tanker, hit Bly Reef in Prince William Sound and millions of gallons of oil um, spread out all over Prince William Sound. Knowles had to cancel all the expeditions that summer because the whole Prince William Sound was a mess. The beaches were full of 10, 20 centimeters deep, thick oil and animals of all kinds died. Um, so before the oil spill, when we were out on these long expeditions, um, basically every day we would see orcas, killer whales. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we would see these big rafts or maybe 100 sea otters uh, mm -hmm. several times a week. We would see bears, you know, playing on the water's edge, catching salmon. Um, we saw, you know, 20 sea eagles or bald eagles every day. Uh, every it gets day. to the point, yeah, it gets to the point where you're like, whatever, it's just another orca. Oh, yeah, you've seen one bear, you've seen them all. You know, I mean, it was amazing, right? Wow. And then. Then the oil spill happened and thousands of people helped out cleaning um, this oil spill. Mm -hmm. And one of the uh, techniques that they had to clean was hot water pressure. Uh, so basically from boats, um, they had these almost boiling water coming through these hoses and then pressure washing the beaches um, to make that oil melt away, which means it settled down at the ocean bottom instead, right? But the beaches were now clean and you can see, still see these white, white rocks. And then you have higher up where the oil didn't hit, where they didn't pressure. Um, so, uh, so anyway, it was one technique that made it look clean, but it didn't really clean up the oil, right? So the damage had been done. So the following years, if we saw one group of uh, orcas in a 30 day expedition, that was good. If we saw a raft of sea otters, maybe five or 10 sea otters hanging out together in a 30 day period, that was great. If we saw one or two bald eagles and sea eagles during our expedition, we were happy. So, that one big oil spill hugely impacted Prince William Sound. Mm -hmm. Now, this is many, many years ago, and slow but steady, wildlife is coming back again. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is uh, um, more common to see all these different animals. The sea lions are back, and uh, the seals are back, etc. cetera. Um, but now the wilderness and Prince William Sound, for example, has also become a tourist destination. So um, 
you have more tourist boats, sightseeing boats going out every day. You have more cruise ships coming through. You have more outdoor adventure groups like Knowles. Uh, you have more individuals with their group, friends and family going out. So, uh, um, so in the past, uh, what we were doing was not unheard of, but it was not common. Now, um, more and more people want to recreate, enjoy the great outdoors. Mm. And of course, more people means more impact, um, means uh, more poop, um, because everyone needs to go to the bathroom at some point, right? So, um, yeah, so it's just uh, harder and harder, I think, for the environment. Um, so, uh, therefore, the leave no trace principles are really important to minimize mm. our impact even if we recognize that we will have an impact. And how do you handle this? Oh, sorry, sorry. I was just saying that we're part of the environment, right? So um, we shouldn't feel bad about visiting the wilderness because it's not like people were made to be in cities. We we're all made to be in the environment. Uh, we have just created these cities. Uh, but So don't feel bad about going into the um, nature and to the wilderness or remote areas or the countryside, but be aware of the impact that we have on both nature, animals, plants, and other people. Mm. Mm. Thank you for that. I wanted to ask about this, how to handle this controversy uh, that would be great for all of us maybe to to be in, in touch with nature or go to go the natural sites more often and still if if we did so we had more impact so yeah. i don't know yeah i mean uh, countries different states different regions deal with the problem by uh, requiring permits from commercial outfitters so you don't have too many commercial outfitters in the same time in certain areas. And also a permit costs money, right? Um, so that money hopefully goes back to restoration of, of trails mm -hmm. or um, saving animals or whatever. Um, but with more just individuals going, enjoying public lands, we don't have to pay. We just have to uh, be respectful and, uh, you know, make sure, for example, where I live here in Bozeman, Montana, in the U.S., um, right now it's uh, lots of bears outside and bear cubs. And the, the deer have their little deer kids, fawns. And uh, um, so having loose dogs on the trail is very stressful for the animals, yeah. right? Think so this that. is the time mm -hmm. to have a, your dog on a leash so so they don't scare the animals who get stressed and then die or the mama bear gets uh, angry and attacks the humans and then that bear has to be shot because they killed or mm -hmm. mauled a human and now we have a few bear cubs there without their mom and that causes other issues so uh -huh. we're all connected and uh, our actions have consequences. Oh yeah, this I really like. Thank you for this 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 interrelated nature of of being out there. And uh, yeah, talking about wild wilderness ethics is uh, is not just a fluffy thing, but it, talking about uh, real consequences also. Right. Yeah. 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 Thank you for mentioning this. I think it it uh, can inspire people maybe living in more more civilized uh, natural environments also to, to be yep. more respectful. And I don't think you have to go for 30 days or 60 days to enjoy the woods. And, uh, and I don't think you have to uh, um, do the most extreme. Um, I think uh, going out in the city park, finding a tree and just sit by that tree for an hour or two will really help us uh, inside to calm down, to reflect and, uh, and just feel connected to something greater than, uh, you know, our apartment or job or McDonald's or 
coffee shop. Um, but I think um, um, the further away you are from the urban noises um, and uh, everything that's going on, um, then I think it's easier to uh, um, just to find yourself in a way. And um, some people say, oh, I'm going to go out in nature, so therefore I don't need my medications, or I'm going to be in the natural environment, and that's going to be stress-free, so I'm going to be totally relaxed for the next week. Well, if you're not used to um, the great outdoors, um, it's probably going to be more stressful because you're moving from an environment, the city, where you are used to the noises, the stress, the, um, mm -hmm. you know, whatever pressure you have on you. And then you go out in the woods and either it's too quiet for your liking or you hear a branch snap or you hear or something yeah. and you're like, oh, what is that? And you get very stressed and you're like, oh, where am I going to go to the bathroom? Everyone is going to see me. Uh, and then you get stressed yeah. and and, oh, I think I'm on the wrong trail. I think I'm lost. And, and you sleep poorly at night because you hear sounds and, and uh, it's, it could be more stressful, right? So taking it in smaller increments, maybe start sitting by the city tree in the park, going out for a night with friends, um, going out for several nights further away, uh, learning the skills. So you feeling more and more comfortable in the outdoors. And uh, I mentioned this little talk about people often think, oh, I'm gonna be in a natural environment, so therefore I'm not gonna bring my medications. One should never stop taking uh, prescription medications or um, whatever you are on when you're home. If you go in the woods, you should bring that stuff with you too. The person oh, yeah. who re reacts to uh, pollution in the city and get an asthma attack, they might not recognize that they're also going to react to pollen in the birch forest and have an asthma attack. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The person who lives with um, a seizure disorder like epilepsy um, and might get seizures because uh, there's a lot of blinking sharp lights back home, um, either in the supermarket or by the computer, um, the same seizure can be triggered by the sun shining through the trees or the sun hitting the little yeah. lake. And it's, you know, we think it's really pretty, but it could cause someone to have a seizure. Seizure, yeah. So continue with whatever meds one are on in the city is very important when you go out in the woods. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's really practical for people starting this journey. And also I think it's useful to, uh, to mention that this incremental, gradual mm -hmm. entering uh, to natural experiences might be also good if you would like to take people mm -hmm. as a guide or as like, anyone who is bringing people out outdoors. Yeah. So think about this. It's yeah. really good. And uh, one question is like, what what is your best hope regarding nature and people? Like, what do you wish for? Like, you've seen a lot. Yeah. Oh, I wish uh, every kid starting in kindergarten, play school, preschool, whatever you call it, would have at least one day a week outside. And uh, that could just be, you know, in the near wood, near little woods next to the school or out in the city park or whatever. I wish for every first grader um, to go on an overnight. It might be to a cabin and they have to walk 200 meters to get to this cabin carrying their own stuff. And uh, then we're going to have a fire outside in the evening and sit along and eat marshmallows and uh, hot dogs. I wish for every second and third grader to have to bike to where they're going to spend a night in the cabin sleeping on the floor. In fourth and fifth and sixth grade, we're going to introduce uh, tents and we're going to carry our own gear and pitch a tent. And then this is going to continue. So in seventh and eighth and ninth grade, you go out for a week every school year and camp out. Maybe you go on a kayaking trip. Maybe you go on a backpacking trip. Maybe it's a bike trip. But you're moving 
in an alternative way to driving or electric scooters or mopeds or whatever, and you're camping out. I'm uh, picturing that this will carry on through a senior high school that you do a little further away, that you might have to go by train to another country, to another mountain region, and you're mm -hmm. doing some kind of multi-adventure, or uh, maybe rafting a couple days or climbing a couple days, backpacking or sea kayaking. Um, so outdoor education is as important a topic as uh, music, as uh, arts and craft in school and physics, English, Hungarian, math, history. Yeah, because yeah. each one of us need all these different parts to, to be whole and to find our way through life, what grabs us. And why would we have to wait till we are um, in our late 20s or 30s or 40s to say, I want to spend more time outside? Uh, we should learn that from when we were kids. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Oh, thank you. This is That's a really good wish. Yeah. I wish yeah. for that too. <laughs> I know. And I have something also in mind. Uh, when you when you came to Hungary and uh, we had this advanced first aid course, wilderness advanced first aid, and also on the woofer, I I was really amazed by the facilitation skills of you and not only you personally but your whole team and it was very consistent whichever experience I had so I became very curious like how do you learn that and mm -hmm. you mentioned before in our conversation that there are some lectures and people can picture it like okay someone stands in front of a class person speaks others listen or maybe sleep and yeah. that's it yeah. And that was not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, our group of trainers who are also professional facilitators, they said, wow, this was something extraordinary. So could you tell a bit of, about that part? Mm -hmm. like, yeah. how, how you train facilitation? Yeah. Um, let me go back a little bit. Uh, so we talked about Knowles. And then on a Knowles expedition, you have leadership skills you have technical skills. We talked about expedition behavior, leave no trace, outdoor ethics. And now we're coming to wilderness first aid and risk analysis and management. And uh, I think when you take a Knowles uh, instructor course, um, we are both learning all these different uh, skills as experimental. Uh, we're out there just doing it, but we also listening to classes where we learn about how to teach, um, how to address a group, how to engage people, and um, um, yeah, how to how to teach, I guess. Um, but it's all it's about personality, but it's also about a culture. So Knowles. And Knowles Wilderness Medicine has a culture of uh, uh, a particular style um, or uh, what do we call it? Style or um, just way of uh, addressing groups. Um, and all these different things, leadership, expedition behavior, um, whatever, were, um, wilderness first aid, it, it's all connected in a way, and it's connected with leave no trace, that first principle, prepare and plan ahead, you know. So, um, so for example, when my company, Crossing Latitudes, um, decides to offer a wilderness uh, medicine course, um, it starts with a course description. It starts uh, with... Um, um, the correspondence via email or on the phone with a person who is curious about the course and have some questions. Um, so it's about uh, excellent uh, communication uh, with each individual. So when you show up on the wilderness first responder, all those other 20 people, I have probably communicated with 10, 15 times. 
And people often start an email. This might be a stupid question, but it's not a stupid question. They have a question and I should answer that, you know, 100% respectfully and honest. And uh, if they sense before they even come on the course, maybe they haven't even paid the money yet, um, but they sense that, hey, here's a person that's really listening to me and answering my questions. And uh, um, they start to feel good about the relation that we are developing, even if we never seen each other. Uh, then I think by the time they come and I say, hey, hey, Arpi, good to see you again. Wow, et cetera, right? And I make that connection. And hey, by the way, I remember you asked me about blah, blah, blah. Um, I have uh, followed up on that, and here's the books you asked about. You know, so I think it, um, if you have that connection, then when you start to teach in the classroom, uh, whatever type of style you have as a teacher, I think people will be more keen on listening to you and uh, respectful. You know, um, and then of course a wilderness uh, first aid course. Each person is signing up because they want to learn, you know. Yes, sometimes our lectures can be long and it's like wah, 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 wah. <laughs> and we see someone nodding off. Uh, but I mean, if we're talking about how to stop bleeding, how to take care of someone who's having a seizure, how to take care of someone who just cracked their skull because they fell and hit their head in the rock, I mean, you want to learn that, right? You are paid to come to this course and uh, you're not going to fall asleep and miss how to take care of a friend who just had a spinal cord injury. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. thanks for the for this uh, great uh, audio uh, um, tools you used here also because you make good use of uh, this uh, I could say drama and improvisation tools also during yeah. the course. So, so yeah. that could be also a lecture where yeah. you right. use drawings and uh, maybe sometimes videos, but mostly yeah. showing uh, as a, I don't know, small theatrical play, like how things look like yeah. or how things happen. And I think it, it really sticks with people. Yeah. But I really, I really loved that one. I mean, I know that you remember things like when I start to, <laughs> I can't, I can't breathe. <gasps> yeah. And you can remember those things, right? So when we go out and do a scenario, uh, then you're going to think, oh my gosh, this person is not breathing well. It's like laying in the classroom. I have to yeah. think, why is this person not breathing well? What's going on? So we connect uh, words and lecture with uh, scenarios and hands-on and experience, and it's uh, an ongoing thing. Um, some organizations that teach uh, uh, wilderness first aid, for example, they do three days of just uh, classes, lectures indoors, mm -hmm. and then they might do two days of scenarios where Knowles believe that this ongoing rotation of, you know, going between the classroom with lectures and demonstrations and going outside for scenarios uh, is very important. Yeah. yeah it's, it's so I, I need to also mention that um, in regards to Knowles expeditions, uh, wilderness first aid and risk analysis and management is also one of the big uh, uh, aspects of a Knowles expedition. So we don't teach a full wilderness first aid course or full risk management course. But these are classes that comes in on a regular basis on an expedition. Uh, and depending on what type of Knowles expedition you're on, maybe you will end up with a, a CPR card at the end. Maybe you will also receive a wilderness first aid certification at the end. Wow. Or if you take a Knowles uh, rescue semester, three months, you end up with a month-long wilderness emergency medical technician certification at the end. That's like a basic ambulance uh, driver position. Um, so, um, so of course, uh, first aid um, 
is really, really important. Um, and when I started to work for Knowles, we had no communication device. This is before cell phone times. Uh, a few years into my experience with Knowles, uh, we started to get VHF radios. And mm. then we got EPIRBs, emergency position radio indicated beacons, like a spot or in reach. And then we start to carry satellite phones and cell phones, all depending on where we are, right? Um, but we don't re ever rely on those technical devices. We rely on our experience, our skills, our knowledge, and our training uh, to help that injured or sick person. Um, so, uh, so every Knowles instructor, they have a wilderness first responder uh, many uh, instructors, hopefully one in each team, has a wilderness EMT. Um, and then, of course, we have to recertify that all the time. Yeah. So, um, so NOLS uh, as an organization is huge. It has all these different uh, aspects like custom education. Did you know that most NASA Astronauts going to space have taken an old expedition. Yeah, that's, so that's one of my questions. I want to. I wanted to get to. I just <laughs> read the article you shared about. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So that's pretty cool, right? So that's the Knowles Custom Education, and then we have the Knowles Wilderness Medicine, and then we have Knowles Risk Services, teaching Knowles. Uh, uh, risk management uh, courses for outdoor program and also uh, safety training for the public. And then we have Knowles Expeditions. So those are kind of the four big chunks of, of Knowles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And can I come back to the astronauts? Uh, uh, like cust custom medication? Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think, why do they choose uh, to take? this type of uh, education in this this kind of tough experience. So what does it give to the astronauts preparing to go to the outer space? Um, well, I never been to space, but it is kind of a, I'm thinking it's similar to being in the great outdoors with a group that if you have conflict, you can't just close the door and say, I hate you. I'm never going to talk to you again. Because in space, you can't just walk away, right? <laughs> You're there. You're going to be there together for the next few months, maybe a year. People are up in the space capsules for a long time, right? So, uh, um, so that's the same on an old expedition, that um, expedition behavior, group dynamics, conflict resolution, um, taking the next step of finding a common ground and working through your problems and uh, um, planning for each day. I think that's uh, one reason why they take a Knowles expedition, because if they do well there on the Knowles expedition, then they can apply the same experience, skills, whatever they learned um, when they're up in space together. Yeah, um, They take uh, the Wilderness First Aid courses uh, because uh, they have to deal with everything that comes their way. If they get stabbed by a tool or something, they have to know how to stop the bleeding. They know, have to know how to clean it out. They have to know how to close that, that wound and monitor it for infection. Um, so uh, uh, they have uh, limited resources up there. So it's a lot about being creative and figure things out. So I think, uh, yeah, so, so those are just a few aspects why I think they have chosen uh, Knowles Expedition as part of their training. Oh. Yeah, and I read they, they take winter courses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, uh, you know, if you take a Knowles uh, Mexico sea kayaking expedition, life is easy, it's warm, everyone is wearing shorts and T-shirts, um, you're probably not even going to sleep inside your sleeping bag at night. You're just going to be on top of it. Life is easy. You don't really need each other the same way for comfort, for feeling safe. And um, so, but in a more austere environment, whether it's uh, 
Alaska sea kayaking in the summer or Patagonia sea kayaking or mountaineering or a winter expedition, uh, you need each other to do well. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you sure you can pitch the tent yourself, but if it's a howling wind, you need someone else to help you out, right? If it's 20 below, you need someone else. Otherwise, you're going to get frostbite on your fingers. So uh, that whole more tougher environment uh, really teaches you a lot, too, in mm-hmm. how to work as a group and how to be a leader of yourself and your peers. Well, and that's why also arriving there gradually to such high level of responsibility and consequences mm-hmm. also matters a lot. But yeah. it can, wow, it can prepare you for a lot as a team also. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And go for it. Yeah, I, I want to talk about also uh, first aid and mm-hmm. wilderness medicine generally. And um, how did this whole thing start? Like, you seem to be in love with the topic. Yeah. <laughs> and you just enjoy it. And you, you also seem to be, for me, you are a person who is spreading the word, not only about nature, but also about. Uh, taking care of ourselves and each other. And uh, this is something I want to ask about, like how did you fall in love with this topic? And also what you feel like people really should know, or it would be great if they knew, since Knowles is really good at teaching non-professionals to do first aid and uh, take care of each other. Oh, two yeah. questions at least. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's interesting because when I prepared for this uh, chat, I thought, um, if I, why am I not uh, an expedition person who go on wild expeditions and then write books or are on TV programs or go around and give presentations, inspirational, when I climbed Mount Everest, when I kayaked around Indonesia, when I, you know, why am I an educator? Um, So uh, um, you started this chat with uh, mentioning uh, how many days I spent outdoors. and, And when you put together all the nights I have spent in a tent um, on the educational outdoor expeditions, uh, we're close to six years. That's how many nights I spent um, teaching all these 20 day, 30 day, 60 day long expeditions. Six Um, years. Six years. And then we had all the fun trips I've been on just for myself. You know, maybe I go camping uh, next week with some friends for a night or two. You know, I've done, I don't know how many nights I've done that, but I have never really been interested in being the solo adventurer that live off that. I do think those people are needed and that's their drive. That's what they um, get inspired by and they inspire other people to go into the great outdoors. Um, But I have always been the educator. And maybe that's because of the background and my family and the camp I grew up at. Maybe it's because I'm lucky to have met Knowles um, instructors when I was traveling and climbing in the U.S. Um, but, you know, that's always been kind of more important to me than doing the big wild stuff for myself, okay? Um, and, um, and when I started to work for Knowles, I didn't really think about first aid. I was thinking more skills of climbing and mountaineering and later kayaking. Uh, But then they said, no, if you're going to lead trips, you need to have the first aid experience. And uh, and we were all offered the wilderness first responder courses. um, And uh, and it dawned on me that that is probably more important than all the other aspects. Uh, Because when people get scared, if they get hurt, if they get sick, if there's no one to take care of that, You know, who cares if you're a strong climber or can do 10 Eskimo rolls um, to the right side and then to the left side? You know, it's 
it's that moment when people are vulnerable that we need to be there for them and help them out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But what's interesting with wilderness medicine is it really started way back when. It started during the uh, wars in Europe with uh, Napoleon. So General Napoleon recognized that he was losing way too many soldiers. Uh, so he asked the doctors uh, to treat these um, soldiers right there on the field where they got stabbed or whatever, mm-hmm. uh, so they could step up and continue to fight for France. And then in the Second World War, they started to create field hospitals uh, to uh, create for injured um, and sick soldiers right at the spot and make decisions if they could be treated and sent back to the battlefields or if they should be evacuated to the larger hospitals nearby or sent back home. Um, I'm sure in Hungary uh, you have seen the... Uh, serious mash um, it's kind of a field hospital during the war and it's kind of comedy and soldiers coming mm-hmm. in injured and the doctors and nurses are taking care of mm-hmm. them so uh, so those type of uh, uh, field hospitals were starting during the second world war um, and that's basically wilderness first aid right um, and then um, in the mid 60s um, then uh, the idea of teaching the public to do CPR uh, was uh, started because they recognized that way too many people died and were not able to be brought back because it was too long time between they fell, um, collapsed, and the ambulance came uh, and took them to the hospital. So someone started to think, well, if we could pump on people's heart and transport the blood and the oxygen in the blood, maybe more people could survive a heart attack. So they started to do CPR courses for the public. So this is in the middle of 1960, 65 or something like that. Um, And then uh, um, in the early 70s, uh, in some of the ski areas in uh, uh, U.S., uh, they recognized that it took way too long time for the ambulance to come from the city um, to take care of someone who fell in the ski area and got hurt. So the ski patrol were taught first aid skills. And there was an organization called SOLO, and they're basically the first group in the U.S. who started to teach um, um, wilderness first aid and wilderness first responder. And it was mainly to the ski patrol folks and then also to some outdoor guides and uh, climbing instructors. Um, Mm. And then as life moved on, that kind of caught on that, hey, you don't need to be a professional nurse or paramedic or doctor in order to help someone. So anyone can learn first aid um, and then, of course, wilderness first aid is just an extension of that with uh, how do we care for someone for an extended period of time if it takes hours or days before the professionals can come. Nothing of this is really unusual because if you lived in the middle of nowhere way back when, uh, where there were no phones or whatever, if uh, your partner fell when they were out harvesting or hunting or fishing or your kids fell down the stairs, I mean, you would take care of them. Um, And uh, maybe that person never got to the hospital because you took care of them. Maybe they were crooked for the rest of their life because the bones didn't settle as they should have settled. But, you know, people survived and folks did first aid. Yeah. Yeah. but, but there's a huge difference, sorry, there's a huge difference also that I, I really like that you mentioned this. It's very natural. Like, yeah. we, we want to do something if we are the only people there. And we will use the only tools we have and we can use. Yeah. And what is taught in the courses we told about is evidence-based right. uh, wilderness medicine. So there's a lot that has been learned. Mm-hmm. And yeah. that's a huge thing. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Keep on. So, 
Yeah, so things have changed for sure, right? Um, when I first started to uh, learn CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, we pushed on the heart five times and we gave five rescue breaths. Then research came out and we did 15 compressions and five breaths. Now the standard all over the world is 30 compressions and two rescue breaths. And this is all based on research, right? And statistics, what actually works, who survives, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you mentioned the evidence-based curriculum. Um, you know, it's an always ever-changing curriculum. Um, you know, your first course, you might have learned something that we now say, sorry, that wasn't, we're not, we don't yeah. do that anymore. Um, doctors Pushing have said, that, yeah, 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 forget about what we taught you 10 years ago. Um, and what's interesting is that uh, wilderness medicine or remote medicine or medicine in austere environments have become its own uh, field within the medical community now, just like pediatrics or geriatrics or what other fields you can be expert in. So wilderness medicine has become its own thing and uh, more money is uh, uh, being put to this studying. Um, and, um, and of course, a lot of uh, information comes through, unfortunately, the wars and what can be done in the field uh, during the battle um, and what cannot be done and how can we take care of people. Um, yeah. Um, but the uh, curriculum that we teach at Knowles Wilderness Medicine is uh, evidence-based and uh, uh, we work with many other groups, um, one being the Wilderness Medical Society and we work with other peer organizations within the same field, and we have board of directors, and we have uh, uh, medical advisors, um, and these are medical doctors that are all uh, uh, expert on their field, maybe head injuries or spinal cord injuries or infection or whatever, but they also have a strong interest in expeditioning, and they spend a lot of time in the great outdoors. Wow. Yeah. And what, what are the like the biggest changes or most important changes you've seen in, yeah. in wilderness medicine? Uh, you know, uh, a few things is um, way back when, if someone gets bit by a snake, uh, we recommended that you would cut along that area where the bite marks were, right? And then you would <laughs> suck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you try to suck out the blood. Well, now we know that the venom um, is not really traveling with the bloodstream. It's more traveling through the lymph system. So when you cut and suck, you don't get any venom out. And you're introducing um, bacteria from your mm -hmm. mouth. And you're probably creating a more difficult problem. Um, so, uh, so that's one area that have changed. Uh, way back when when someone hit their neck or back or potentially hurt their spine or their spinal cord, we ask them to move their head back and forth, side mm -hmm. to side, and roll around to see if it hurt or if they start to get any tingling or buzzing uh, or numbness in their fingers or toes. Now we say, no, don't make that person move their head because we could potentially do more harm, right? Mm -hmm. um, way back when, if someone, someone was hypothermic, like really, really cold, maybe they were lost in the woods for several days with, now, with no food, no water, and poor clothing, or they had fallen into a, an ice-cold lake, or they had been buried in snow, like in an avalanche situation. Mm -hmm. So they were severe hypothermic. So in the past, we just uh, heated the core, but now we think of the patient as a whole person. We know that the blood will be pumped, circulated out, not just to the uh, lungs and the abdomen, uh, but it will go out to the tip of the fingers and the tip of the toes 
So we always wrap the entire person um, in our hypothermia wraps. Um, and we don't leave any body parts outside uh, because that's not going to help the, the person. Because the oh, blood yeah. will go out to to that limb as well, and then it will come back cold again. Um, yeah. Let's see, what are some other things we have? Um, not so far back, we thought it was okay to drink as much as you could. We said, oh, water is not dangerous, you know. Uh, we had uh, slogans like hydrate or die, and that message became very loud and clear. People were drinking and drinking and drinking water. Everyone carried a water bottle. And people were guzzling um, tons of water. Now we, need, now we know that there's something called hyponatremia, uh, water intoxication or water poisoning. And we know that it could be very harmful. You can even die if you drink mm -hmm. too much water. Um, so, uh, you know, if people drink too much water um, and don't eat, um, they start to get a headache, uh, they feel weak, tired, there might be some swelling of ankles or wrists, uh, you can have bloating, start to feel nauseous, mm -hmm. some people vomit, uh, then the, you might start to have changes in the level of responsiveness. Basically, the brain is not happy. You get disoriented, irritable, combative. You can go into coma and you can die mm -hmm. because when you have so much fluid in your system, you dilute the whole system and each cell needs those electrolytes in order to communicate with each other but now when you have so much water in your system that you have just kind of washed away everything, then the cells cannot communicate and things starts to happen. Oh, yeah. um, and so, I mean, a lot of things have changed um, based on research. For example, when you took your first wilderness first responder course with me in Sweden, we talked about rice, rest, ice, compression, elevation. When you took the wilderness first responder last year in Slovenia, we said, rice is out. Sure, you can always rest if you hurt your ankle or mm -hmm. wrist. That doesn't hurt. Uh, ice, as in cooling down, we don't say we should do that because we want to minimize swelling. We say nowadays that we cool it down more as pain management. Um, compression could be more support not to compress and minimize swelling, but just support so you don't hurt your ankle again and again. And elevation, not for minimizing swelling, more for comfort during the night maybe. But rice as a concept uh, was probably not the best. Um, we want to, the body to allow the swelling because now we know from research that swelling actually helps the healing and maybe when we were very aggressive with the rice rest ice compression elevation we actually made it the uh, the healing take longer time so instead of an ankle um healing in a in 24 hours it could have been three or four days that that person mm -hmm. were limping along you know so uh, it's an evolving and uh, ever-changing uh, um field um yeah yeah way back Thank when we covered both eyes when someone injured an eye mm -hmm. uh, because we were thinking that if we just covered the injured eye and the non-injured eye kept moving then that will do more harm to the injured eye now you know people who are expert on eyes have told us that's not the case so nowadays, the new thing is to only cover the injured eye. But, of course, if the person is uncomfortable and prefer to have both eyes covered, then that's okay. Mm -hmm. But we don't have to cover both eyes. Uh, yeah. Most people well, like to be able to see what's going on around them. Yeah. 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 And what, what I really like uh, in the list that you just 
shared with us is that it can be also a, like a taster of yeah what kind of information is there and it's also very useful for for people because there is a lot of uh like old tradition or misinformation spreading around and it's good to be yeah. educated uh, yeah. based on research and also i really like the approach uh which resembles me the approach you have with nature on those courses that that you think of the body as a whole and you treat it with respect and you are curious about it and not too busy rushing in and just cure it quickly but think about it I like wound management i was really surprised in a in a good way when when you shared like you don't use a lot of uh disinfectants and a lot of chemicals but like a lot of water and soap can help and your body can help and thinking about not only the the things that go in but thinking about your body like you don't want to uh, ruin cells in your body with things you right. put in. Yeah. So that's very educative. And uh, yeah, thank you for this also. And I wanted to ask about uh, uh, how you handle this uh, situation right now with COVID-19 and uh, if we can go there. I don't know if you feel like... No, because no. everybody's talking about all time and right. it's been long, but, but still... Yeah. That's a question. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so my company, Crossing Latitudes, we have canceled 16 Knowles Wilderness Medicine courses, both in the U.S. and in Europe. Um, though we have now started to book new dates for the falls, and people are signing up, both on the short Wilderness First Aid courses and the Wilderness First Responder courses. And I have to say that I'm very proud to be be part of an organization like Knowles, who are really open, transparent uh, with their decisions and allowing us who sponsor and arrange courses and the instructors to have an input. Um, they always put uh, the uh, staff, whether it's administrative staff or instructional staff and our participants, students, and uh, uh, our well-being and health first. So, uh, so it has, even if it hurt financially to cancel this many courses, it hurts more emotionally, but I think it's been easy decisions because when you put people's health and safety first, you know, there's no question about it. We needed to cancel these courses. Um, and now when we learn more about the virus and how we can live side by side with this virus, then we're slowly starting to open up. And I feel comfortable with the um, uh, strategies that Knowles Wilderness Medicine um, and my company, Crossing Latitudes, have come up with. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, for example, classrooms. Um, if you think back of the classroom in Slovenia, it was a very small classroom. We were very, very close. Yeah. So uh, if I want to use that classroom again, I have to have fewer participants. So we have more distance between us, right? So we have looked a lot about classrooms and ventilation in classrooms and outdoor teaching space that can be used in conjunction with the classroom. That's just one small aspect of it. Um, the uh, emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic raises questions about health and risk management. Um, so uh, we want to, to make sure that each participant are aware of how we are responding to the coronavirus pandemic. So each participant, each student can make informed decisions if this is something they are comfortable with. So mm -hmm. for example, um, right now, Knowles is creating a little two, three, minute long video that people who are interested in taking a course um, need to watch before they sign up um, so they can see that this is probably how it's gonna look like in your classroom with masks, with gloves. This is how scenarios are gonna be. And these are, are some of the strategies that we're gonna use to keep you safe and us safe. And if people feel like, nah, I can't do that, that's too much, then they should not come on one of our mm -hmm. courses. 
if they feel like, yeah, I can buy into this, I sign the paper, then they can come. Yeah. Wow. So informed decision. Wow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, um, you know, so, so Knowles and Knowles Wilderness Medicine and Crossing Latitudes, uh, we're in consultation with the federal authorities, with state, with the countries we teach in, with local public health experts, with other organizations teaching first aid, with our medical advisors. And of course, this will continue to evolve as we learn more about COVID-19 and how it affects us, right? But close physical contact is part of giving first aid, you know? Yeah. Um, we will continue to interact with each other on our courses. We're gonna touch each other uh, when we practice all these skills. Um, we're gonna continue to splint each other's legs and arms. We're gonna lift each other in different ways. We're gonna stop bleeding. Uh, we're gonna do the basic life support, CPR. Um, we're gonna do all the scenarios because that's mm -hmm. Nose Wilderness Medicine's core. We're not gonna do video first aid courses um, yeah. or webinars. We might uh, give participants more videos to look at to get reminded of what they learned on the course. Um, but we're gonna continue to teach the way we always have taught. Um, now, we're also gonna educate everyone in how we can reduce the risk of um, infection, transmission, of course, right? So we have uh, basically five strategies um, that we are working with, and uh, we expect all our participants to uh, fully adhere to this. And if people can't adhere to these strategies, then we're gonna ask them to leave the course because mm -hmm. each instructor and participant, their well-being is the most important aspect. Um, so one strategy is the screening, um, basically daily screening, both um, uh, temperature check. Mm -hmm. So we'll have wash stations and more hand sanitizer. Uh, uh, we're gonna really point out to someone, hey, you just touch your face again, or hey, if you need to sneeze, you need to do it in the crook of your elbow or cough in the crook of your elbow. Uh, we're gonna wipe down surfaces um, mm -hmm. on a regular basis in our classrooms. Um, so, um, so there will be more focus on, on hygiene. Um, we're gonna focus even more on the personal protective uh, equipment. Um, so that is, uh, we're asking participants to bring uh, protective uh, masks and uh, a cloth mask or a buff, you know, that you, yeah. you wear double folded or triple folded, yeah. you know, that will be uh, okay. We, Knowles Wilderness Medicine, will supply better masks that we're gonna ask both participants who play the rescuer and the participant who play the patient to mm -hmm. wear in scenarios. And of course, we'll have gloves for every scenario, new gloves, every scenario. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and then we're also gonna ask people to bring protective glasses. Mm -hmm. And if an eyeglasses or sunglasses is all you have, that's good enough. Or if you have some kind of face glass shield, um, you know, like a carpenter glasses that covers the side, you know. So that's what we're gonna do. Much more focus on the protective uh, personal equipment. You know? Distancing, we're gonna try to be six feet apart in the classroom or at least arm length apart from each other. Um, and uh, uh, whenever we're practicing skills, um, then we're gonna ask people to wear the glasses and wear their mask and, and gloves. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then the compliance culture is a strategy that we believe in the value of training people to help others and in supporting the best public health practices. So we're gonna model um, our commitment and quality medical care 
uh, and we're going to support these strategies the whole time um, because, you know, we're creating habits, right? We're creating a culture. Um, we're going to help each other to remember these practices. We're not going to slam someone who forget to put on a mask or the glasses, uh, but we're going to remind them and we're going to say that's part of being a medical provider and therefore we do it even if we are doing wilderness first aid. Um, and then, of course, we're asking people to stay home if they feel sick or uh, then they should not come to class. Yeah. Um, what's very interesting with all these is that, you know, in the, the 80s, AIDS, HIV virus, taught us to wear gloves. No mm -hmm. one wore gloves before that. So then we learn about bloodborne pathogens. Now, um, in 2020 and COVID-19, coronavirus, we learn about uh, uh, respiratory pathogens and mask is becoming the, the norm. So who knows what we're gonna learn about in 10, 15, 20 years, maybe mm -hmm. there's something else, right? Um, but people say, oh, this is kind of overkill. Um, but like I said, before HIV, no one wore gloves. But now it will be crazy to be in a medical emergency and not protect yourself or your patient because body substance isolation goes both ways. I'm not just protecting me against what the patient might have. Mm -hmm. I'm protecting the patient, what I might have on my hands or what I might be spitting out. So, um, um, so even if it's going to be a real challenge to teach behind the buff the whole time, and as you know, I teach a lot with facial expressions and oh, yeah. sounds. Um, how is that going to be if you don't see my face? Yeah. You know, so body language will continue to be really important of my teaching. And I need to be able to look at people. And when I discuss things with you, I need to see your eyes to, to mm -hmm. read some of the things that I otherwise might have read around your face. And, mm -hmm. you know, so, so it will be. To, a, so you're going to have the, the lecture parts and the whole, whole uh, training with mask on as, um, as a facilitator. Yeah. It depends on the classroom. If we can keep uh, six feet, two meters apart. Um, but, you know, if you have a large group, that means that some people are way far away. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I have a strong voice. And maybe I can be 10 feet, 12 feet away from the closest participants and, and, and be okay without a mask. But I also know that I tend to spit when I'm talking. And yeah. that will be the worst thing, right? If the instructor spits in my participants' faces. Um, yeah. So, uh, um, yeah. But we want to at least start out with the courses we have in July, August, September, um, doing the best we can. And then we'll see where the COVID-19 takes us mm -hmm. and how things are going. And, um, and maybe... By the time I have a wilderness first responder course in Slovenia or Switzerland, maybe we can ease up on some of these uh, restrictions or guidelines. Mm -hmm. But it's yeah. important that, that that's because of learning on the way and not, not because of just, okay, I'm tired. Right. That was it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. not easy to maintain. But thank you for mentioning yeah. the HIV uh, situation with the gloves because it can be that, yeah. Masks mm -hmm. will be part of uh, first aid kits also. Yeah, Can exactly. Yeah. 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 Our um, Knowles uh, Wilderness Medicine Curriculum Director, Todd Schimmelfenich, yeah. he said that um, we're training people to become healthcare providers. We know that infection control is important. We know that masks, distancing, surface cleaning, and hand washing are powerful in infection control tools. We are gonna be better than anyone else, but we're not gonna be perfect. Uh, we will have interactions with our students. We cannot go into our classrooms expecting that we'll totally mitigate the risk of transmission. 
because people are going to be close to each other and we will interact with each other. We have to feel comfortable working in that environment, knowing that we're going to be as reasonable, as practical, and as thoughtful at mit mitigating the risk. But the risk is not going to go away. Yeah. Mm. So that's just like going into the wilderness. Yeah. You can plan ahead and prepare. You can manage the risk, but accidents will happen. And the more we think about it before and just prepare for it and do the best we can, it's not going to go away, but maybe we can minimize the consequences. And yeah. Yay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for this also. And uh, well, there could be a, way more things. I also uh, heard uh, Tochima Phoenix uh, interview on uh, mental health, mm -hmm. first aid and stress injury. So that could be another topic that, uh, yeah, maybe it's a huge change also mm -hmm. recently. Like, it's yeah. getting, like we people, yeah. we become more aware of that mm -hmm. it's also part of first aid. Yeah. And it's a real injury. That people can have mm -hmm. but yeah yeah we ran a long <laughs> but i think it's really good it, it's gonna be hard to edit anyway mm -hmm. uh, yeah is there anything else you feel like okay that's i wanna say a few sentences about that or we skipped or missed some part um, actually all i want to do is i want to thank you for doing this you know, this is a, a, a great way, um, not only to uh, uh, share information, maybe inspire others. And uh, my reason for being part of this was not to sell Knowles, the National Outdoor Leadership School, or our wilderness medical courses, um, but more inspire people to enjoy the outdoors and uh, take a first aid course with whatever company you take, you're gonna learn new things, right? And uh, we have a lot of students that have taken many courses with different companies and you learn different things from different organization. And then you have this greater toolbox with you. So if something happens, um, you are, yeah, you have more tools, you have more thoughts, you have more knowledge, um, you can improvise better maybe and help your friend. Um, so, uh, so I want to just uh, thank you guys for providing these opportunities for folks like me to talk. And uh, I hope to come to Hungary and teach uh, wilderness first aid um, soon again and see yeah. you all on courses in Europe. Yeah, yeah, I hope, hope that too. And I really thank you for this. Like, maybe we just keep it like, like as it is. <laughs> because... <laughs> Yeah, that's really useful. I believe it uh, oh. for anyone mm -hmm. uh, right now. Yeah, and uh, I really wish you the best uh, regarding the COVID-19 situation and also generally with the new situation in the US. I think like your uh, thoughtful and conscious uh, attitude generally could help uh, so yeah. to steer things. I, yeah. I didn't want to go into that, like how are you, but I hope you are well. Right. Oh yeah, I'm doing well. Um, sometimes I joke in a not a politically correct uh, way that COVID-19 is killing me uh, because I find myself having a little bit more time. So uh, you'll be proud of me. I'm out running 15, 20 kilometers trail running. I am biking. I am doing way more uh, backpacking uh, day trips or overnight trips with friends. Um, and uh, with the COVID-19, um, because we're trying to uh, not be in large groups, anytime a friend of mine says, hey, Lena, do you want to go on a hike tomorrow? I say yes, because that's right. an opportunity for me to be with that one person for a few hours or all day long. Uh, so I'm in better shape than I've been in a long time. Uh, <laughs> I weigh less. And uh, uh, sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm so tired. Do I have to go on a run again or bike <laughs> ride again? Uh, this is killing me. But I'm truly enjoying my, my new energy and the physical fitness. And, uh, you know, and I really hope that I will keep it up even when 
I find myself working in the office more um, mm. because that's usually what's hindering me from saying yes when people ask if I want to join, that I have too much going on in the office booking first aid courses. So, so I'm really healthy. My husband is healthy. Uh, my friend Benjamin here is uh, healthy yeah. as, as, as well. And, yeah, for uh, the people who are just listening, uh, Lena has a very nice colleague, uh, skeleton like <laughs> Benjamin. <Yeah. laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, so we're healthy. But, you know, it is impacting everyone around us and our life. So we're adjusting to that. Yeah. And we're playing it pretty conservative here. Um, we're not in our 30s or 40s anymore. I'm at the late 50s. My husband is early 60s. So, yeah. Wow. It's yeah. great to hear that you're well and you take care. Yeah. And I really appreciate your time. Really, right. really, thank you for yeah. that. And Thanks for yeah. inviting me, Happy. Take care. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. If you find it useful or inspiring, please follow us on YouTube or Facebook. And if you have a question or you get inspired by a specific part of a podcast, please leave us feedback in the comment section on YouTube or Facebook. We really appreciate your feedback and we would like to create episodes that really serve your needs as learners and as professionals. Thank you for being with us. See you next time. <laughs>